So uh, not too long ago, I came home and I excitedly told my wife, I'm going to be doing TEDx Broadway. And the theme is the best that Broadway can be. And she looked at me deadpan and said, they're not going to get that by giving you a monologue. <laughs> so there was the inspiration for my talk tonight, <laughs> which is willing suspension of disbelief. And the power of these two little words, if you can say what if, you can experience real world magic through technology and innovation. And so I'm a techie and an entrepreneur. And unfortunately, my first startup was a fail. Um, we failed to get off the ground on time. We started in March of 2000, right after the NASDAQ crashed. We failed to get through September 11th when our bank got shorted by another bank, which got linked to arms trading, and poof, no more startup. And normally, you'll hear that in the world of entrepreneurship, you need extreme belief to get yourself off the ground when you hit failure. And I'll tell you, at that time, I was the entrepreneur who just missed the World Wide Web. I was broke, I was despondent, and I had no belief left. But what I learned was I didn't need belief. I just needed to allow myself to say, what if again? Now, if you do a Google search and look in Wikipedia, you'll find that psychologists tell you that to create suspension of disbelief, you need to give the audience some new context, some new alternate framework of reality that they can step into. And when I started my first company, the context was the World Wide Web. And we were at one computer per home. And then I noticed something. We were going to one computer per pocket. And that allowed me to say, what if? What if I started another startup while I was having my first kid? What if my wife wouldn't leave me then? Right? <laughs> um, what if there was an opportunity bigger than the World Wide Web? And so it was that I caught the mobile wave with a moderately successful startup whose mobile apps platform we sold to Intel. But I don't think that was the last big context change that was going to happen. In fact, I think there's a much bigger one going on right now. And we techies call it the Internet of Things, where there's going to be one computer in everything we own. Our watches, our cars, our kids' toys, our toilets, you name it. And what do you do when you have a successful startup? Well, you take the first opportunity you can, and you join the dark side, and you become a venture capitalist. <laughs> so that's what I attempted to do. But I didn't want to invest in just anything. I didn't want to invest in the next Flappy Birds or social network. I wanted to invest in really important stuff. So I went to my now partners, and I said, hey, we should invest in big, world-changing things. We should do impact investing. And they said, what? Whoa, young buck, what's going on? Because when investors hear impact investing, they hear a crazy guy that wants to waste his money, and he probably wants to waste hours too. So I said, no, this time is different. There are these big industries where there's something strange going on. Costs are going up instead of coming down when technology is being introduced. And that defies what I call technology's law of gravity. Moore's Law. Whenever technology is being introduced, costs should come way down. And if they're not, there's going to be a huge disruption. I mean, the cost of a college education has doubled since 2000. But we definitely can't say that college graduates are twice as educated. So I went back to my partners and I said, hey, something's different. And they said, what makes you think that we're going to be able to tackle these problems when people have been trying to forever. And I said, well, there's this Internet of Things thing. This time it's different. The context has changed. And they actually said, hmm, what if he's right? Maybe we should try this. So we went on to start Aspire Ventures, which is kind of an ongoing experiment in how to create startups that have really big impact in a repeatable way. And since 2014, through this year, we'll have deployed over $100 million of capital into big, world-changing things, at least we hope. And one of those 
one of the first areas that we're going to be focused on is healthcare, because healthcare is one of those areas where it just gets up and slaps you in the face, whether it's because you've lost a parent to cancer or because you're turning 40 years old and your back hurts enough some days where you can't get out of a chair. But the story that really convinced me that the Internet of Things had real applications in healthcare was the one of a friend of mine who called me up one day and told me that his then two-year-old son had been diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Now, type 1 diabetes is a disease I'm familiar with. And I had a two-year-old daughter at the time. And I immediately could sympathize. I thought to myself, what would it be like if I had to wake up my daughter every night because I was scared to death that she was going to die as a result of a hypoglycemic event, as happens to many type 1 children. And so I called up another friend who was both type 1 and a medical researcher. And I said, hey, give me the scoop on the latest and greatest. There's got to be some great device that you can strap to your body that monitors your blood sugar and pumps in insulin when you need it. And he said, hold on. There's not one device. There's two. There's one that monitors your blood sugar and one that pumps in insulin. But they don't talk to each other. And they're really unreliable. And they're big and they're bulky. And there's a needle on each one that you strap into your body. And most people wouldn't wear one of those devices, let alone two. And a two-year-old definitely couldn't wear them. And I thought, that's stupid. We've got all these new sensors coming out. We've got Fitbits and heart rate monitors and sweat monitors and all kinds of things. Why should you need a needle in your body to figure out what your blood sugar is? And so this was a problem that was one of the first we tackled when we started Aspire Ventures. And truth be told, for a couple of years, we really couldn't get out of our own way. And the stumbling block was that we thought we needed to believe we could solve the problem. Our people would constantly come to me and say, hey, the drug companies and the device manufacturers are pouring billions of dollars into this. What are we doing? I mean, we're doing nothing by comparison in terms of putting in resources. We need more time. We need more money. We need more everything. And there was a real struggle going on in our organization. But thankfully, we have a pretty wise COO. And she came to me, and she said, Assam, you have to stop asking for people's belief. You have to ask for their suspension of disbelief. And she actually went to them, and she asked for that. And within weeks, we came up with breakthroughs that we believe will enable us to submit the first non-invasive glucose monitor to the FDA within the next few months. But why stop there? What if we looked at healthcare broadly and said, where can we apply Internet of Things technologies? What if we built a new facility that integrated these technologies everywhere we could think of? So that's what we're doing. We're building a 140,000 square foot facility right now and collaborating with institutions all around the world, like Sheba General Hospital on the R&D side. And I find it ironic that when I take my son to get a haircut, I don't find it ironic that he has hair. I just <laughs> find it. I just find it ironic that when I take him to get a haircut, there's no wait time because we use an app that just lets, that lets us walk right in. When was the last time you had an experience like that in healthcare? <laughs> but that's the boring stuff. What if this is how physical therapy looked? That's an FDA approved technology that lets you do physical therapy in front of a TV screen and it puts you in a game and it tracks your body far more accurately than a doctor could. So it becomes fun. And when you go to see the doctor, the doctor can talk to you about what you need to do instead of asking you whether you did your exercises and having you lie to him. <laughs> or what if your dermatology appointment could happen anytime you wanted to in front of your TV screen? And it could give you advice on acne and psoriasis and all kinds of things whenever you ask for it. Or some fun examples. What if your underwear could tell you whether you're about to get an injury. <laughs> or your cast could tell you that your muscles were atroph atrophying and what exercises to do and how often to do them. Or the pills that you take could deliver just the right dosage based on what's going on inside your body right at that time. And my favorite example, what if you're, <laughs> sorry. 
<laughs> what if your toilet could tell you whether your paleo diet was really working, right? Uh, so this is going to be the only time I ever get to do Shakespeare on Broadway. All the world is a stage. All right, I'm done. Um, <laughs> But people only go to see the shows that they really want to. And those are the ones that make it to the world's biggest stage. And my challenge to you is to say what if. And if you do that and if it becomes infectious, the next time you hear about a crazy idea like, I don't know, self-driving cars, if you really want it to happen and your friends sense that and engineers decide that they want to work on those problems and investors decide they want to invest and politicians decide that they should regulate it for it, should regulate for it you may get real world magic a little sooner than you thought. And for me, this is the best that Broadway can be. It could be our inspiration to suspend our disbelief and to say what if. Mm -hmm.